Jonathan Haidt, welcome back to Penn. Ah, oh, it's a pleasure to be back. I miss uh, Locust Walk. And uh, what was that bar that used to be at the end of Locust Walk? Is I couldn't tell you, actually. You don't go don't... to bars, I know. I No, I just I haven't been to campus in so long. Uh, I'm so glad you're here. Apologies, everyone, for tardiness. Uh, we are live. We're thrilled. Uh, John, I want to start by telling you that I was wrong and you were right. About uh, what? Well, m multiple things. But the one I want to start with is I remember when you first wrote your article about the coddling of the American mind with Greg. I, I, I understood the point you were making, but I didn't quite believe it. I, mm -hmm. I, I remember thinking, you know, my, my students have lots of rich intellectual debates in the classroom and all views are welcome and we love to debate ideas. And I think that's true in some classrooms and mm -hmm. with some cultures, but this, it seems like you had a crystal ball and you anticipated the culture wars that we're now facing and many of the cancel culture reactions that we're now seeing crop up in all kinds of environments. And so I just love to start by, by asking you, what did you see happening that led you to realize that there was a problem brewing? So, um, so I've been studying, well, I study moral psychology. That's what I began at, at Penn. I, uh, I entered the grad program in psychology in 1987, and I got my PhD uh, in 1992, and I was looking at cultural variation and morality. And in 2004, I got really alarmed about how left and right in America were like different countries. So I, I began using moral psychology to look at political differences and understand our polarization. And it was just going up and up. And so I decided to write The Righteous Mind to write a book about it. And it was sort of like, you know, all the trend lines were going in the wrong direction. The metaphor that I, I uh, used at the time, uh, well, uh, the metaphor that I, that I used was like, if you're a doctor and you're operating on a patient and the life, the vital signs are not good. And, uh, you know, and then things are sort of, you know, going down. And then all of a sudden, the, like the giant light complex that they have above the operating table kind of falls on on the patient on the abdomen cavity like that's a that's real like all the trends were really bad and then more bad stuff um happened and that's that's kind of what it uh what it felt like uh and i well i would say that the thing crashing in is social media but we'll get there later um so i don't know i i'm uh, i bat uh, I, I'm almost always wrong in every decision I've made for my stock portfolio, my retirement accounts. If I'd simply done the opposite of everything I had ever done, I would be a richer man than I am today. So I'm terrible at forecasting that. But if you study moral psychology and you can really see, you know, and you, you can see how uh, how we how conflicts escalate and where they're going, uh, you know, that may be why uh, why I I was alarmed about this before other people. Um, for the country and then for universities. Um, and, um, and I would also just want to praise you, Adam. You, know, you should write a book about how people change their minds. That's actually, you know, it's really good of you to have done that. <laughs> I, I feel like I have to now, right? Because I'd be accused of hypocrisy if I, if I didn't think again. But uh, I, you are one of the people who consistently forces me to rethink. And I, I've, I've tried to enjoy it. Uh, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's fun. Other times I feel like I'm wrestling with you know, with a, a belief I really want to hold on to, but let's let's start let's start with the question of what's going wrong, and let's let's begin since we are here at Penn at, at a university uh, with the university version of this problem. What what is causing the set of issues that you're diagnosing here? Yeah, um, well, so um, things really changed on campus around 2014 to 2015, and in the, uh, the basically 2014 is when lots of things changed. And Greg Lukianoff was the first to really notice it and put a name to it. He's the president of the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education. Uh, he's a friend of mine. He came to talk to me in 2015, 2014 uh, about strange stuff he was seeing. Uh, Greg uh, was prone to depression. He, he'd been suicidal uh, a few years before and he learned cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, and he saw students suddenly making arguments that seemed straight out of the CBT manual about catastrophizing, overgeneralizing, dichotomous thinking. You know, this doesn't belong on campus. I mean, critical thinking is the opposite of, you know, anxious, uh, distorted thinking. And so uh, Greg came to, uh, to talk to me and his initial hypothesis was something we're doing on campus is teaching students to think in these distorted ways and that might be making them depressed. And in 2014, 
we were just beginning to hear all these reports of campus mental health centers being flooded, but there was no hard data on it yet. I looked and looked and looked. I couldn't find any data in 2014 to 2015. Um, so we wrote the we wrote the article and we made this argument about what's happening and how it's like CBT. And we thought that it was something caused by college. The article came out in August of 2015, and then campuses really blew up that Halloween, beginning at Yale, and then it went national. Um, but over the next couple of years, we learned, oh my, we were wrong. This is not being caused by college. Rather, Gen Z arrived in uh, the first, depending on how you cut it, but basically Gen Z, born 1996 or seven, depending on what you say, uh, they show up on campus in September of 2013, roughly. Uh, new ideas come in. Also, social media changed radically between 2009 and 2011. I didn't know that at the time. I just, I just learned that two years ago. So it turns out that while campus was the first place to blow up in this, in this, with this new morality, some would call it wokeness is one name for it, uh, but, it um, but it's complicated and there's a lot of trends. So while it first really flowered on campus in 2014, 2015, and then it spread to the corporate world, now it's down in high schools, especially elite prep schools, um, the arts, nonprofits, it's not everywhere, but it is in most of the creative industries. Um, it turns out the causal story is much more complicated and interesting because it wasn't just college. So we, we can talk about those trends, but that's, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, this is a really fun time to be a social scientist, I must say. <laughs> you know, it's like if I was studying shipwrecks and I was on the Titanic, I would say, wow, I get to study a shipwreck. <laughs> no, you would, you would, you would study the shipwreck after you got off it, right? That's the Oops. problem. I, I hope, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, this, this is, this is, I think you're right. It's a fascinating time to be living through. If only we weren't living through it. Uh, and <laughs> yeah. or only, if only we knew that there was a happy ending. Yeah, that be, would help. But there might not be. Well, I'm hoping you can lead us to that ending by the end of this conversation. Okay, but, let's give it yeah, a So let, let's break down the trends for us. What, what do you think are the major contributing factors? So, uh, so in the book, we go through six different trends. It's almost like threads or fuses that kind of all come together around 2014, 2015. I won't go through all of them here. But the really big ones that should concern everyone are rising political polarization since the 90s, um, massive change in social media between 2009 and 2011, and the arrival of Gen Z with very high levels of anxiety, depression, uh, uh, self-harm, and fragility. So those three things, uh, that really affects universities, democracies, and, um, and, and now that Gen Z has graduated, now corporations. So just very briefly, so political polarization, there's a lot of ways to define it, but if you keep your eye on affective or emotional polarization, how much do you hate the other side? That's the key thing. Because Americans aren't really coming apart on like abortion. We're not like suddenly split into two camps. We're actually mostly sort of, you know, in the middle. Um, but if you look at how much we hate each other, that was actually pretty constant in the 60s, 70s, 80s, into the 90s. It was pretty flat, you know, somewhat negative, but not terribly. And then suddenly in the 90s, the hatred begins to rise steadily and it just keeps going up all the way through today. Um, okay, now that makes everything worse because we evolved for tribalism. We're really good at doing us versus them. You know, a Penn football game, uh, the campus is fundamentally different the night before than it was a few days earlier. So we're, we're prone to tribalism and modern uh, liberal institutions kind of suppress that and allow us to live together with diversity and diverse views. So uh, this polarization really makes us more tribal, more aggressive, and more stupid because we can't think outside of our tribe. If we do, we'll be kicked out. In fact, just two hours ago, I actually joined a Penn class uh, that was looking at these issues and all of the students agreed. They, you know, they, they self-censor a lot in class. They don't, they don't dare ask a question, questioning certain propositions. So polarization has affected all of us, that's one. Two, uh, social media. Uh, this is so interesting because I, I'm not, I don't use that much. I'm on Twitter as you are, but not much else. But I teamed up with Tobias Rose Stockwell, uh, who's writing a book on this. He's, a, he's, he's been in the social media industry for a long time. And what, what I learned from writing this article, it's in the Atlantic, uh, uh, I forget the title, but it's, um, what we learned is that social media, when it comes out, is like, you know, MySpace and Friendster and the Facebook, and it's not polarizing. It's just look at me, look at all my friends, look at the bands I like. It's, it's just you know me, me, me. But it's not polarizing. In 2009, Facebook introduces the like button, and suddenly they have a lot more engagement and data about the engagement. 
Twitter copies it and they introduce the retweet button, which Facebook copies. And now it's not just that things are engaging, it's that you can forward the things that are most engaging, which means most angering. So, uh, so, and before 2009, American teens were not mostly on social media every day, but you look at the adoption curves, it's those two years to 2011. So by 2012, American teens are not going over to each other's homes that much. They go home and then they communicate on their devices. Uh, and so, um, uh, and social media communication is fundamentally different because you're not really talking to your friends, you're talking at the audience. So that's the second thing. Uh, it becomes much more of an outrage platform than the news media adapts to the outrage platform. And that's why the 2010s have been so weird, not just on campus, but across many liberal democracies and, and now companies. And the third, oh yeah, the third is Gen Z is fundamentally different psychologically from the millennials. Uh, now it's not, a, you know, it's not a sharp line at 1996, but if you were born in 1990 and you have a younger sibling born in 1997, Odds are their childhood was different because in 1990, you didn't get Facebook until you're in college or afterwards. And by then your brain is mostly formed. So the millennials are not, they're a little more depressed than previous generations, but it's not, it's not a hockey stick. It's birth year 1996, you, it's a hockey stick where the rates of depression skyrocket. Uh, for boys and girls, uh, they're up more for girls. So the percentage, as you know, they're sort of double for both, but girls start with higher rates. At any rate, the point is, um, uh, we have a generation coming onto campus not as likely to have the mindset of kid in a candy shop. Wow. I mean, I remember my first years, at, I went uh, to Yale undergrad, and you know the courses were in a blue book. And it was just the greatest thing to get the, you go through all these possibilities. Wow. I, I want to take 19 courses. Um, I want to do all these activities. But you have the arrival of a generation which is much more prone to say, oh, what's dangerous? What's threatening? And if you come to college with your front right cortex hyperactivated all the time, you're gonna, the whole environment will be different, much more threatening, much more conflictual. You're gonna be much more upset at things people say. And if someone in one of your pen classes asks a question that shows they're not on your team, you're gonna be much more likely to say, hey, you've hurt me or you've hurt her or whatever. So you put these three things together, rising political polarization, and of course campuses are mostly left-leaning, so they become very much on one side. Um, social media becomes an outrage generating platform, and we have a generation that is much more anxious and depressed, and the result is a very rapid transformation, really a phase change on a lot of campuses, not everywhere, but especially elite schools in the Northeast, the West Coast, a few in the Midwest, a phase change. I mean, it happens within one year. Does wow. that make sense? Yeah, I mean, there's there's so much to dig into there and unpack, uh, and I want to I do want to make sure we get to talk about some of the solutions. But let's let's zoom in for a moment on political polarization, which I think a lot of people woke up to in 2016 and said, "Oh my gosh, yeah. things are completely different." You're saying no, that actually goes back two decades further. Yeah. What what's causing people to hate the other side? Yeah, so there's two things. Um, the polit so political parties traditionally were agglomerations of interest groups. And if the you know the northern industrialists had common interest with the western railroad people or the southern farm whatever you know it's agglomerations of interest groups and when it's interest groups you can actually compromise and the people in it are different because they're from different parts of the country or whatever that way politics can work uh, and um, but what happened uh, so we used to have liberal republicans and conservative democrats were in the south liberal republicans in the northeast and the west you know. So it, it, as many people have heard, in the 1960s, poll questions show people don't, Americans don't care if their child marries someone from the other party, but someone from another race or religion? No, I, that would be bad. And poll questions now show exactly the opposite. Uh, very little concern about another religion, a little concern, but not much about race, and a lot of concern about politics, political party, because beginning in the 90s, it started in the, in the 70s, but we get the, the decline of the conservative Democrats, the decline of the liberal Republicans. By the 90s, the Clinton election is the first election that has the electoral map that you'd recognize today. Uh, that's when all the liberals are in one party, all the conservatives in the other party, and now the people in the other party are really different. They're not like us. They dress differently, they eat differently. They're really different from us. They have really different values. And uh, that plus the rise of a certain kind of identity politics means that politics now in America it's not so much about issues. It's not about material interests. It's overwhelmingly about identity. So Ezra Klein has a great book where he summarizes all this recent work called Why We're Polarized. And that's his main argument is that it's become all about identity. And now it's about religion. And I don't mean 
religion like Christianity. What I mean is tribes organized around identity issues uh, fighting over sacred issues. And that's, and again, has no place on campus. That just destroys what we think of, what you and I think of as a campus environment where we talk about ideas and we can debate things. Yeah. So you mentioned differences in values. One of your big contributions to this debate was moral foundations theory. Walk us through the different moral foundations that liberals and conservatives seem to anchor on. And then I want to, I want to challenge it a little bit. Great. Okay. So uh, when I was, when I was at Penn, um, I got my mind um, blown by Alan Fisk. He was an anthropologist in the psychology department. And uh, I'd never taken an anthropology course, but he taught a cultural psychology course. I read a lot of ethnographies of societies around the world. And I'd read the, I read the Hebrew Bible. I'm, you know, I'm Jewish. I, I read it in college. Uh, and it's kind of stunning, like the book of Leviticus and all this stuff about menstrual taboos and food taboos and skin lesions. Like, why is all this body stuff moral? Like, what is going on here? And I thought that was just weird. Okay, but then you read most other human cultures throughout history have done this. Like, and you see it very clearly in Hinduism, in Islam, in ancient Judaism. Something about the body is, is, is a big part of morality, except in Western secular culture. And now we have this great book on this just came out recently by Joe Hendrick, The Weirdest People in the World, Western Educated, Industrialized, Rich, and Democratic. So what we have to see is that the normal human morality is really broad. Yes, it's about issues of care and harm. You know, that's what philosophers have focused on, either care, harm, or justice and rights. That's what Western philosophy and ethics have been, those two. No question those are part of human nature. We're mammals. We have all kinds of stuff built into our bodies as mammals and into our brains for caring. And left-leaning politics really builds on that. So if you go to any sort of leftist protest, you'll see uh, often a lot of stuff about love and compassion. Um, so uh, that's the first foundation is care versus harm. Second is fairness versus cheating. Uh, and the third is liberty versus oppression. Those are three that are you find all around the world um, and both left and right build on all three of those. Um, but then there's three other foundations that almost everyone has except for secular liberals. And I shouldn't say they don't have it. What I should say is they don't build on it. And those are, um, uh, loyalty versus uh, betrayal. That is a sense of group loyalty, um, uh, you know, very team oriented. Um, and authority versus subversion and sanctity versus degradation. So these are very clear in nationalist movements, especially right wing, you know, blood and soil nationalist movements really build on those three. And that's part of the reason why progressives generally reject those because they say those are conservative, those support nationalism, racism, they're bad. Uh, and so, you know, imagine if you if you were the whip in Congress, you know, you're responsible for getting the party together. You know, which which, which job is harder, being the Democratic whip or the Republican whip? You know, there's no competition. Um, Republicans are much more, well, generally more loyal, or they they care, they put group first uh, on average. Uh, so anyway, um, that's the theory that I began developing the, a little bit at Penn, and then especially at the University of Chicago, I had, did a postdoc with Richard Schwader, a brilliant anthropologist, um, and working with him, he sent me to India, and I had just amazing experiences there that opened my mind, ultimately even to to conservative thinking and values because I was on the left very much and I hated conservatives in the 80s and 90s. Uh, but trying to understand people in India helped me understand Christian conservatives in America. And that really opened my mind. So anyway, almost any culture war issue you want to talk about, you know, flag burning, uh, defund the police, almost anything. Um, if you look, if you listen to the dialogue on both sides, you'll hear them referring, making arguments and stories that rest on different moral foundations, sort of like different taste buds. Yeah. Okay, good. So I think these these differences clearly exist. Uh, I, I think they, they seem to be overstated by a lot of people, though. Okay. Right. So I, if, if anything, I would have said my understanding of the left right divide is the left caring more about equality um, and the right caring more about liberty. Uh, and here then you have this. Okay, so pause there. But then you have this whole debate about the Colin Kaepernick situation, mm -hmm. right? Which is him exercising his liberty mm -hmm. and conservatives are objecting to that. Mm -hmm. And I, I just have a hard yeah. time making sense of a lot of these kinds of moments mm -hmm. through the lens of my understanding of these moral foundations that we're supposed to share. Right. Okay, um, so, so help I, me understand that. Great, so let's walk through it because right, things get complicated. And so we can say, of course, conservatives should care about liberty 
But if his action is, as they see it, defaming a sacred object, namely the flag or the anthem, that trumps it, that takes precedence. In the same way, many people have asked me, wait, you're saying that, you know, people on the right will write to me and say, you're saying that progressives and, and leftists, they value care? Well, then why are they pro-choice? I mean, if, if anything is vulnerable, it's the fetus, it's the unborn child. Um, and, you know, if an anthropologist came from Mars and just had a guess which side, they would guess that the left was the one that was pro-life. But because the left is also pro-women's rights and women's, so the, 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 so you have to look at how each party evolves historically within each country. And so in America, the abortion debate was incredibly powerful for decades. That shaped a lot of other things. That comes first, everything else arranges around it. Similarly, like in Britain, Brexit now is sort of, it was sort of doing that. Um, so it's, it's often uh, not simple. And it's definitely not a simple like, oh, you know, turn it up to seven, therefore you'll care about all these things. The moral foundations are foundations. They're not the house that you live in. Moral and political entrepreneurs build a house on that foundation and they try to invite people into it and they try to knock down other people's houses. Yeah, that's very helpful. So I guess it, it then leaves me wondering, like how are, are these foundations not just justifications that we generate post hoc? Uh, you know, I, I have a particular stance on abortion and now I reference a value to support it. Um, sometimes it is that. And the fact that we can see parties, uh, you know, quite clearly, you know, the Republican Party on, on the Romney health care plan, um, it, you can find uh, parties flipping or, you know, the, the Republicans on Russia. Uh, obviously, Russia changed since the Soviet Union. But the point is, um, the, the tribal loyalty trumps everything else. That comes first. And so conservatives are a little more disgust sensitive. They should be more sensitive about germs and disease coming across the border. But once Trump defined coronavirus as a Chinese virus and not real, and masks are for, you know, for wimps, whatever. So Trump and many others on right-wing media are the moral or political entrepreneurs who defined things for their audience, linked them to certain moral foundations, backed them up by stories of evil and hypocrisy of the left. And then, and now because of social media, People are ensconced in a bubble so thick that they, you know, literally the majority of Republicans think the election was stolen. And that could not have been the case 10 years ago. So what do we do about this? Um, I, you know, I, I look at this and I say, look, I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I identify as a, a psychologist and a social scientist. And what I want to do is figure out how to how to overcome some of these divides. But people who take that stance, especially since January 6th, the insurrection, have just been vilified. No, don't, you know, don't, don't yeah. equate these two sides, right? Mm -hmm. Don't, don't cr create any kind of moral relativism here, right? One, right? you know, one, one side tried to overthrow democracy. And then, you know, I, I hear that. I think, well, actually, that group thought they were defending democracy right. by everything I've read. So how do we get right. out of this? Yeah. So first, I just want to make the point that if you say you're not on the right or the left, uh, that means you're a centrist. And you know what? Centrists are right adjacent. Look it up in geometry textbooks. If you're in the center, you are right adjacent. So that could be a problem for you. That's what some people say about me. Second, Wait, but John, hold on. Let me let me just make sure I understand that because I think if I look at the the stances I've taken on particular issues, my views lean more liberal than conservative. Yeah, that's the same as me. But if you're not with us, you're against us. That is the, that is great untruth number three in the Colleen the American Mind. This binary worldview. That's a cognitive therapy distortion. But I'm very much like you. I'm. I'm sort of temperamentally in the middle to a little bit left. Um, I, on social issues, I'm I'm on the left, uh, but I do think there's value in listening to multiple multiple sides. Uh, let us also stipulate that in America, with a two-party system, the left saying you're on the left does not mean you are liberal, and saying you're on the right does not mean you are conservative. And if you look at say, you know. Like you know, Mitt Romney versus Barack Obama, that was clearly a you know a uh, you know Romney is clearly a, a conservative. You can trace Romney back to Edmund Burke. This is the long tradition of conservative thought, uh, and it is principled. And same with Obama as a as a progressive, as a liberal, as what in America we call a liberal. Okay, so in 2012, our politics was not insane, uh, but it, Trump is not in any sense a conservative, except that he hates the left. And now, because it's all about identity and we're so polarized, as long as you hate the left, you're 
you know, that, and that's basically what the Republican Party has become. It's not a party of issues anymore. So to make the point, um, you can be in the center or you can say you're not a Democrat, but you can still say it's not that both sides are equal. There is a liberalism on the left, and we'll probably talk about that soon. Um, but the liberalism on the right is much bigger, a much bigger part of the right, uh, and is much more dangerous. It is much more dangerous to control the White House and Congress than it is to control the universities, the New York Times, the New Yorker. So uh, I, I'm definitely not like in the middle on everything. I think um, you know, right now, of our two parties, one is really, really sick and um, needs to suffer many defeats and reconstitute itself as a true conservative party. Unfortunately, they have a pretty good chance of taking back the House in 2022. All right. So what's your theory of change? Not not just, you know, not just yeah. talking about Congress, but talking about in society. How do we combat this polarization? Yeah. So there are many causes of it. I just talked about three and there are about five others. And some can't be reversed and shouldn't be reversed. One of them is that we're more educated. Um, when The more you have people getting a college degree, the more they take part in identity politics and symbolic politics rather than uh, material interests. So there are a lot of, re and all, another one, another big one is that war has incredible effects on the generation that remembers it for the rest of their life. And so the late 20th century was a really unusual period. We had very high social capital in part because of World War II and its effects on my parents' generation and your grandparents' generation, I suppose. Um, and so there's a lot of stuff we can't recapture. Uh, but a couple of things, one thing that absolutely needs to change before we can get out of this is we have to have major changes in our information ecosystem. I think, you know, we've seen polarization rising since the 90s, but what really blew a lot of our minds in 2020, beginning with Trump in 2016, but especially with the election and the Capitol riots and QAnon, is people saying, you know, how can they possibly believe this? And it's not just a fringe belief. So there's all kinds of great work. There are lots of really good books coming out. One I'll especially recommend by Jonathan Rauch is called uh, The Constitution of Knowledge. And there's an amazing quote. This I, I, I love this quote. I, I, I cite it whenever I whenever I can, if I can find it quickly with you here. Um, and the, But the gist of it is that before the year 2000, or back in the late 20th century, there were nodes that did some quality control. There were editors, there were experts, and the news was a professional organization. Uh, and that wasn't true in the 19th century, but the, the mid to late 20th century, we had, there were nodes. Um, and then we got then we got um, social media, and uh, first we got the in okay. So we had broadcasting. Everyone's on the same page. We all watch the same news. We agreed on basic facts, like about Watergate. We agreed on the basic facts for the most part. Um, but then you get uh, cable TV is narrowcasting. Then the internet allows everyone to confirm whatever they want. And then social media means everyone can communicate with everyone and rate everything. And there are no editors anywhere. And so things, there's no check on truth value, it's emotional value. And so this is, uh, here it is. So here's the quote from, from John Rausch. Um, he says, the techno utopians of the information revolution assumed that knowledge would spontaneously emerge from unmediated interactions across a sprawling peer-to-peer -peer network with predictably disappointing results. Without the places where professionals like experts and editors and peer reviewers organize conversations and compare propositions and assess competence and provide accountability everywhere from scientific journals to Wikipedia pages, there is no marketplace of ideas. There are only individuals running around making noise. And that's where we are. So as long as that's the case, I think we continue to go down as a, as a country, as a democracy. Um, other countries are having trouble here. This does tend to help demagogues. Uh, Federalist 10, Madison writes about this. The Federalist, the founding fathers knew about this. Democracies tend to go down because demagogues inflame the passions of the people. So that's where we are now. Uh, now, if history is a guide, it's always been wrong to bet against America and the odds are we'll pull out of this. Also, new technologies are disruptive and, and we had the we had the techno we had the techno optimism phase up through the Arab Spring. We thought, wow, democracy is going to flourish because of Facebook. And now we see that wasn't true. And now we have the techno pessimism phase because of Facebook and Twitter and other other platforms. Um, but somehow or other, these platforms will be different in five or 10 years. So I, I think if they don't change, I don't think we can get out of it. But if they do change, then I think we can look at the other nine things we have to change.
Okay, good. So you mentioned marketplace of ideas needing to flourish. Uh, mm -hmm. One of my favorite John Stuart Mill ideas, uh, the, I think the assumption being in the long run, at least, the marketplace is efficient. Yeah. Uh, and we're dealing right now with a, a short-term inefficiency is the hope, right? right? So universities are supposed to be the best of those mar marketplaces. That's we're right. really struggling with that right now, as, as you highlighted earlier. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen, uh, I've, I've had conservative students come up to me and say, I don't feel comfortable uh, raising questions in class right. uh, that people, you know, might might object to. Uh, I've I've had students, um, mostly on the liberal side, try to bully students who do ask mm -hmm. certain questions. Yep. And I pushed back hard against that and said, "Look, I believe in psychological safety, which is not a safe space. It's right. the freedom to take intellectual risks and right. know that you're not going to be punished for having a complicated conversation. And we need to build that." That's right. And I, I thought I thought I was maybe on solid moral ground there and also solid empirical ground because our colleagues, Amy Edmondson uh, and Bill Kahn and Ingrid Nebhardt and so many others have studied how important psychological mm -hmm. safety is for people yeah. to raise problems and suggestions and, and hash out different ideas. And then I had very thoughtful pushback uh, from a student who said, it's easy for you to say as a white man mm -hmm. when nobody is denying the existence of your identity or trying to oppress <clears throat> your group. Mm -hmm. And I've been thinking a lot about that, and I, I'm not I'm not sure what the response is to that. So, no. John, you've been you've been studying yeah. this for years. You've been thinking about it for years. Yeah. You also are a white man, but can you help me think through this? Sure. So, first, while Mill never actually used the phrase "marketplace of ideas," it was um, I forget who uh, from the 19th century, but it, you know, but he certainly argued that uh, this this you know that he who knows only his own side of the case knows little of that. You have to listen to other people to get smarter. Um, uh, and so, but the marketplace, I think it can work, it can work fairly well. And as we all know, um, a marketplace with no laws, no rules with where people can intimidate competitors is not a free market. You get incredible price distortions, but if you have a well-regulated market, uh, and people are judging just based on the quality of the goods and what they want, then you get, you know, the miracle that Adam Smith wrote about. And obviously, uh, when people can be, uh, uh, damaged or ostracized, for anything they say, and and the uh, extent of it is unknown because if it, it gets picked up by you know Fox News or or it becomes a thing on Twitter, uh, you know your your life chances can be ruined. So um, we certainly don't have a functioning marketplace of ideas where there are protections for buyers and sellers. That's and that again is in part social media, uh, but it's other things as well. So uh, and we we need it now. What's going on on campus, I believe, is that there are uh, there are two conflicting moral worldviews, and I would say that they are related to two conflicting teloses. So the, the telos, like the Greek word telos from Aristotle, the, you know, the, what is the telos of this institution, the purpose, the goal, the function for medicine, its health. Uh, for universities, we think it's truth and our practice, our institution, our practices are designed to find truth from flawed, motivated individuals. And that's the miracle of, of a university when it works well. And it produces huge amounts of innovation and discovery. And that's why American universities are the best in the world. We've topped the rankings for a long, long time. But there's a very different mindset that came in in 2014, 2015, uh, which is I, I mean, it, the telos, the goal is, is social justice. Now, remedying inequalities, removing discrimination, these are admirable goals. We need people to work on social justice. But an institution can have only one telos. It can't ha have two highest goods. And it's and if you want to reorganize the university to be anti-racist, that is, our function is at every level and in every class is to fight racism uh, and to reduce inequities, which are differences of outcome. Well, it's like you're trying to retrofit a car to be a can opener. Um, it's it, it's it, We're not designed to do that. We're designed to do this thing about teaching and learning. Um, and so that's the, that's, I think what we're going through now is that many people, you know, it's, it's a minority of the students, but it's a lot of them. It's a minority of the faculty, but it's a lot of them. And it's a lot of the administrators. Um, it's rarely the president. The president is almost always a person on the left who has liberal values and believes in the more John Stuart Mill University. Um, so we are facing an incredible bout of incoherence. Uh, and this is what you see, because most professors are on the left, but if they're older, they're like, what? You know, I don't understand wh what you mean. Like, what are you even talking about? And that's what happened when we started hearing students say, you're denying my existence. Um, 
I mean, if you ask a question, if you ask a question about whether a theory is true, it's not obvious that you're denying somebody else's existence. But if that rhetorical move is legitimated and said, yes, that you can say that, um, if the professor legitimates that, or if the university legitimates that kind of discourse in the classroom, um, then you can't, you don't have that, that, that you, you can't have this, uh, this free exchange of ideas. Now, if, if, and, and of course there are, there are indignities, especially African-American students, women, they do face indignities and it is important to have norms. Part of psychological safety is you don't tell jokes of this sort, you don't use slurs of this sort. Those truly are offenses against, uh, against groups. Uh, but to say that free speech is, is is something that just white men want, uh, there's a long tradition going back to Frederick Douglass and through many black intellectuals in the 20th century, pointing out that the powerful people always get to speak. They don't need guarantees of free speech. They always get their ideas out. Free speech over and over again throughout history, throughout American history at least, is the tool needed by those fighting for their rights, fighting for recognition, fighting to challenge existing ideas. And if you are challenging existing ideas, in the long run, you win. This is what Jonathan Rauch writes about. He's gay and he writes about how the gay, the gay rights and the marriage rights movement, they didn't vilify their opponents, they argued against them. And it's, you know, it's kind of hard to make good arguments against gay marriage. And so they argued against them. What's happening now on campus is not, ar not making arguments, but it's, it's using rhetorical and s devices and social pressures that leave most people intimidated. And you talk to people on the left, and many of you, I'm sure you've had these conversations. You know, people on the left are afraid to speak up um, because it's an intimidating environment. And in the long run, this is activism that makes enemies. It doesn't win people over. So it sounds like then you think that students who are, are perpetuating cancel culture are maybe winning a battle but losing a war. Yes, that's right. They are able to dominate the rhetorical space because... Uh, the administrators and professors generally back down. They generally don't challenge them because they're afraid of, of being called bigoted. So um, that's why we have this climate of fear, which first emerged on campus in 2014, 2015, but now it's spread to a lot of the corporate world. I've had the very similar conversations with people in Silicon Valley. Uh, it's not in all industries. It's not in manufacturing at all. It's not in restaurants, uh, but it's all over the arts, um, nonprofits, uh, media, journalism, and tech. In those, uh, those places have become, you know, you look at Google. Google used to have what was said to be the best corporate culture. It was a model of corporate culture because as they said, they modeled their culture after college. They loved the college environment. It's great for innovation. It's fun. Let's have slides and snacks and, and open exchange of ideas like college. Well, guess what? Their culture is still modeled after college and college culture kind of sucks. Right now, anyway. Right now, yeah. In some ways. Yeah. Well, this I've, I've already touched on a bunch of the audience questions, but this goes right to the heart of one of them, which is, what can we do to promote more diversity of thought? And where do we draw the line between giving a voice to those who might have controversial ideas or unpopular ideas mm -hmm. um, and those who are actually perpetuating some kind of injustice? Yes. So these discussions are almost impossible to have if you don't specify the institution. So often these just are like, in society, what views should be allowed? Let's okay. talk about university then. Thank you, yes. So if we're talking about a university, which is different from a company, but in a university, um, not all views should be allowed. In a university, you can't just come on and say the earth is flat. You can't just come on and say the Holocaust never happened. You have to have evidence and it has to, be evidence, not just you know a screenshot from some website. It's, so if you're a scholar, if a scholar can come, you know, if a scholar who's got a PhD and is an expert in geology or ge whatever, and he can prove that the Earth is flat, he should be allowed to present his evidence. Now that isn't going to happen, um, you know. But if a scholar had evidence that the Holocaust didn't happen, again, if they have evidence, let them present it, and it, it most likely will be ripped to shreds. Uh, now. Um, so anyway, so in a college campus, if you keep your focus on the telos, the purpose, why are we doing this? Free speech is not an end in itself. 
it is a means to an end, and the end is the production of knowledge and truth. So we keep your eye on that. So now the question is, is someone, if a scholar comes with, a, with research on sexual development or gender development, which has some implication for the questions of, of, of uh, trans, uh, transitioning and, and transgender, if, if it's a scholar or researcher who has evidence on it, yeah, I think they should be allowed to speak. And people who are on the uh, who think that they, people disagree with it, let them get the practice of actually confronting those ideas, listening to them, and then learning how to argue against them. Uh, you can't just argue that because I construe this to be hostile to someone's identity, therefore we can't allow it. Once you say that, now everybody gets a veto, and and now you can't. Now the university breaks down. Why bother going if if you know any any controversial idea gets vetoed? Well, because you want your Wharton stamp that will help you on the job market in your in your future career. That is a separate conversation. For now, but, no, but no, actually, it's an important part of this conversation because that is true for now because we have the legacy effects in which a college education is still very valued as a signal. But people hiring in the elite companies, they see the problems with many of their students coming out of the elite schools. And if there was an alternative where they could get excellent candidates, they would do it. And Google is trying to disrupt it. My stern colleague, Scott Galloway, as a... a uh, what's it called? Something for he's developing an alternative. Uh, so you know, college is incredibly expensive. It's not as much fun as it used to be, and you don't come out able to think as well as you used to. So our product is still very expensive and respected, but it's plummeting. And so unless we reform, uh, find you know, people have been predicting the disruption of higher ed for you know twenty years, uh, but it's going to happen unless we really make our product great, and it's not great right now. That goes to another question from the audience, which is the rise of cancel culture defined as blacklisting people for comments made in the past seems problematic at face value. But is this simply another manifestation of the invisible hand of the market for the digital age? This person says, as a consumer, I am well within my rights to not support certain companies or follow certain celebrities. How truly problematic is cancel culture? And John, I'll just add to this and say, yeah. at this moment, somebody will be inclined to say, all right, uh, freedom of speech, of course, is not freedom of reach or freedom right. from consequences. Right. Yeah. Um, so, okay. So certainly in, let me just find the, find this amazing mill quotation about corn merchants. Uh, uh, of course, it's a corn merchant or corn dealer. I didn't even, all right, I'll, I'll just pan it up. So yes, every individual can choose what to buy or, or who to listen to. That's not a problem. But as we see, there are sort of, sort of mass effects that are different. And so any bookseller can decide not to carry a book, but if Amazon does it, they're so big, that really changes things. Uh, similarly, any person can disapprove of someone that's because they said something 20 years ago, it's a private decision. But if the way you express that is by tweeting about them, demanding that they be fired, demanding that the university that admitted them not admit them, uh, now you've got these emergent effects that are incredibly cruel. So when I was in Brazil, I did my dissertation research there, and I was stunned that you could walk down the street and there would be holes in the street that you could fall into and really hurt yourself. I was like, wow, thank God I live in America where there are all these lawyers that will sue if, you know, you know but there was just a lot of physical danger. In, if you go, you, you know, if you, at the time, they were called third world countries. You go to uh, non-developed countries and there were a lot of physical dangers. And we've wiped those out in the Western world. It's very safe. But we have this thing where with a single misplaced click, you can destroy your life. And you know, thousands of people's lives are severely damaged. A lot of people are committing suicide because they are so shamed by what's happened. So we've unleashed this technology that has these mobocratic properties, that it generates mobs that otherwise wouldn't be there. These mobs descend on people. Uh, it's incredibly painful. Um, it often has very severe consequences for their lives. Uh, so I think that by, whether you talk about efficient markets or whether you talk about basic humanity, this is incredibly cruel. This is an incredibly cruel technology, which has a lot of victims. And I think it needs to be reformed. How would you reform it? Um, uh, for one thing, uh, I think it's very, uh, uh, it's very important to have some sort of know your customer uh, or know your user requirements. And I take those terms. So this is something that Tobias Rostock and I began to develop, but my colleague here, uh, Vasant Dar, linked it up with know your customer, know your user. Uh, and so Facebook, you know, you, you used to, you, anybody could advertise, anybody could get an account, you know, you can make whatever mayhem you want, worst comes to worst, you get shut down, but you open 20 more accounts that day. Uh, now Facebook at least is doing some know your customer stuff. I'm not sure for everything or just for political advertising. Um, because of course, 
the customer is not the user, the customer is the advertiser. Uh, but similarly, the product, the user, uh, at present, you can just make as many accounts as you want. You don't have to prove age or anything. Uh, and that leads, that means a lot of people can have anonymous accounts, even on, on Facebook, on, on certainly on Twitter. And when people are anonymous, as, as we social psychologists know, boy, can they be cruel and nasty and racist and all kinds of other ugly stuff comes out. And so we could immediately clean things up a lot if we said, uh, anyone can create an account to see what's going on, but if you want to put content out there in what is now our public square, there has to be some, you have to be at least verified that you're a real person. Not that you have to use your name to post or that Facebook knows who you are, but there are ways we could do it where it, when you want to if, be able to post, you get kicked out to it, some nonprofit, some identity verification thing that at least confirms you're a real person with a name. And then it goes back to Facebook. Yes, he's approved. He can get an account. And you can have a and, fake name there. And John, and so that's your work around for an authoritarian state. Exactly. That's right. Because, yeah, that's right. We don't want, yeah, because, of course, the internet is very, you know, well, faith, and social media is very powerful and is not just used by Americans. It's used by a lot of people. Uh, for And in some countries, Facebook is the internet. Um, anyway, my point is just that there, this is a complex dynamical system. And by moving certain parameters up or down, the emergent properties can be much more cruel or much nicer. And we've all seen areas of the internet that are really nice um, and others that are just cesspools like Twitter. Um, so there are a lot of settings that can be changed that would produce big improvements in how nasty versus constructive it is. You might say in how much it's a nasty market where people are constantly buying stuff that kills them versus a very safe market where every market exchange is beneficial to both parties. Let's go to what we can do individually to try to change this while we're waiting for some of the more systemic and structural yeah. solutions. Uh, one of our audience questions is about saying, hey, you know, somebody in the, the political center, all of a sudden I realize that, you know, these different sides may often be working from these different moral foundations. Uh, how do you help bring them together? And I'll just add to that. My instinct was to say, let's work from the common foundations. Let's talk about you know, care and harm. Let's talk about liberty and oppression. The problem is though, as you pointed out, people have different interpretations of these same values. Yeah, that's so right. we try to talk about care and harm and liberals say, I want equality of outcome and conservatives say, I want equality of opportunity. And we're right mm -hmm. back to square one. Yeah. So wh where does the common ground actually exist? That's right. Uh, so um, so I, I would start not with the, with the foundations. I would start with uh, with moral humility of each individual, and that's what the righteous mind uh, was. You know, a lot of it was about. And I don't come to this as a humble person. I, you know, I'm, I, I'm, but, but, you know, but that's wait, I, that's a funny statement. What do you mean by that? Oh, I just mean I'm not like. Are you, you saying know, I'm a narcissist? <laughs> I was saying, like in the positive psychology list of strengths, uh, and also according to you know my friends and uh, you know girl girlfriends from long ago, uh, they would not have called me a humble person. Um, but it, I, I was I was always arguing, and you know like like Ben Franklin, if you read his autobiography, very much the same thing. He you know he his friends took him aside and said, Ben, stop it! You're alienating everyone. You don't win your points because you know you're you know, and and he learned he learned to be more gentle. Um, and the most important thing about moral discourse and talking to people is start by acknowledging something about what they're right about. That works like magic. When I was at Penn, uh, my first year of grad school, um, uh, uh, Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People, a bunch of people were reading it, and it was one of the best books I ever read. So advice, everybody, read Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People. Uh, read The Righteous Mind. Uh, I think that'll also give you tools to talk. But uh, but I'm much better at avoiding arguments. I, I rarely get angry. I used to be angry. I was angry all through the Reagan administration and you know much of the Bush administration. And I you know I, I now people will say you know of course you should be angry about many things these days. And I I certainly am strongly opposed to many things that are happening or that were happening especially in recent years. Um, but yes, you can you know basically be slower to judge and quicker to forgive. That that's two things that that sages have been telling us for thousands of years. You know, the great religions don't tell us be more judgmental, throw people, well, okay, maybe some passages do, but the ones that really endure, the ones that we revere today, like the Dalai Lama, the Sermon on the Mount, parts of the uh, the prophets, um, slower to judge, quicker to forgive, and your relationships will go better and you'll go further in life. I, I, as a personal policy, that makes a lot of sense. As you know, as an institutional set of norms, or even mm -hmm. as a societal set of norms, a little harder. Like, how quick should I be to forgive the people who led an insurrection, or Harvey Weinstein, for that matter? Yeah. It, where okay. do you draw the line? Okay, sure. Out in the public square, 
yeah, I mean, Weinstein should should go to jail. Now, the people who led the insur insurrection, as you said, they actually thought they were defending democracy. So, you know, those that trespass in the Capitol should be prosecuted for it. Uh, and some of the people, it was a very mixed bag of people, and some of them are, you know, nasty pieces of work. But most of them, I'm sure, were kind to their friends and children and liked in their community. So I wouldn't say if you were there, you should be shunned. More importantly, let's focus on a particular institution. If you're a university, uh, in fact, I was just talking to uh, to the president of a, of a liberal arts college um, who said they had a case of a student they admitted, and it turned out he had some white supremacist stuff on his posts from a couple years earlier. And there was a big uproar, don't admit him, don't admit him. Um, but the president said, well, um, what is our purpose here? And shouldn't he be just the kind of person who especially should be exposed to the great ideas and the liberal tradition? And, and it turns out the guy was a very interesting guy. He actually wasn't even white. He was mixed race of a couple of different races. Uh, and, and he, um, uh, he came and he had a hard time the first year. Students gave him a hard time. But by the second year, he'd really adapted and grown. And so again, keep your eye on the telos of the institution. What is it for? And you know, I, I said truth before, but we're not just researchers, we're also educators. And we have, so I would say in a sense, we, we have one telos as researchers, which is truth. But we have another telos as teachers, which is, well, you know, educare, I forget what the Latin is, but it means like to raise up or bring up. Like we, we are tasked with, growing our students and so wait yeah. a minute wait a minute you what? said an institution can only have one telos and now you're giving me two competing ones okay no 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 no. i'm sorry i'm sorry the institution has the telos of truth but we okay. as teachers we as teachers play different roles and in our research we should not take into account the well-being of our students in our research we must we are completely beholden to the truth in our teaching, we must never lie, we must never give untruths. But here, we do have to be more sensitive to their emotional state. We don't just say, hey, hey, this is the truth. I don't care what you think. This is the truth. Like, no, our job is, as teachers, is more complicated. And it, and it, it like being a parent, it, it has multiple, there are multiple parts to it. Another audience question that I thought was fascinating is, is cancel culture a new phenomenon or has it simply taken on new forms and incarnations in the 21st century? Mm -hmm. And I, I started thinking of, uh, you know, of witch hunts, right, oh, yeah. of, of centuries past. That, that seems like a form of cancel culture. It's unbelievably similar. I mean, the, so in chapter five of The Coddling of the American Mind, we open with the example of witch hunts. And I, it was really, really fun to read about it. So the way that I think about it is there are these, because we're, we're evolved to be tribal and religious, and so we evolved to think about sacrilege and taboo and burn the witches and cast out the evil ones. Um, and that, and so you know, traditional religions or uh, uh, you know, societies have a lot of that. Um, so that's our normal nature. And so yes, this has happened uh, many, many times. Uh, certainly, the witch hunts. Uh, it happened, uh, uh, you know, on the right with uh, uh, communist purges. Um, and many people say now on the oh, and many people uh, say that actually the the Cultural Revolution in China had very similar dynamics too. Also instigated by college students uh, trying to to wipe out and destroy everything that was old and replace it with new. So this has happened many times. A metaphor that I that I use. Um, is imagine that you're the California Department of, of Forestry or something, and you've got a lot of experience dealing with forest fires, and you know there are going to be forest fires. We know how to deal with them. Uh, to, you know, you've got a lot of, lot of experience. And all of a sudden, one day, the Earth's atmosphere changes from 20% oxygen to 80% oxygen. Now what happens? Like, oh my, like every, you know, any spark blows up and you can't put it out. So that's what social media did. Uh, we have a lot of experience with these waves of, cancel culture over thousands of years. Um, but in between 2000 and 2011, the information exchange environment changed from 20% oxygen to 80% oxygen. Everything's combustible now. That makes it much harder for us to do our job. It's much harder in Silicon Valley and some companies for them to do their job. Uh, people spend a lot of time on these internal conflicts. Um, non many nonprofits are becoming dysfunctional. So things are not working so well these days. Okay, I want to wrap on something related to that. 
which is I remember a dinner we were at together in 2016 where you placed a bet on the outcome of the presidential election. Yes, that, yes. And I, I, start, I started this conversation with yeah. a prescient <laughs> forecast that you made. This is the other end in the spirit yeah. of maintaining your humility. Mm -hmm. uh, you yeah. bet $10,000 that yeah. Donald Trump would lose the election. Yes, I did. I did. He did uh, not. He did not. That's right. So, what, so what's your, what's your postmortem and what are you anticipating moving forward? Yeah. So this was, so to be clear, this was uh, uh, shortly after Trump had won the Republican nomination you and I were at a dinner with Roger Martin, uh, who we both love and admire and who's brilliant and who had predicted before Trump won the nomination, he predicted Trump was gonna win the presidency. And at this dinner, he was going on and on about how he, you know, he, he's confident Trump will win. And I was based in my analysis that, well, Trump is not a conservative, he's an authoritarian, or at least he's appealing to authoritarians. And so, yes, in a primary process where it's the extremes that vote, sure, he can win the Republican primary, but there's no way he can win 51% you know, of the country because he's just, it's just an authoritarian appeal. And, and, you know, and listeners won't remember, I mean, the reason why I said $10,000, it's crazy, it's completely nuts, but it's because Mitt Romney, uh, at one debate had said, I bet you $10,000. And of course, you know, as a you know, millionaire to do that. So it was a stupid thing. I don't know why I said it, that, that, but that's why I said, it, I think, but, um, but, you know, Roger took the bet and, um, uh, and I lost and I lost because what I didn't see, what I didn't see is that American politics used to be about you vote for the candidate you prefer. But beginning in 2004, it actually shifted. Political scientists say we entered a zone of negative partisanship where primarily we're voting against the candidate we don't want. And a lot of America was fed up, and this is true, this is breeding ground for populism, but you don't have to be a populist or an authoritarian to be fed up with what was happening in America and the way things were going and the stagnation and the, the inequality and the everything. So what it turns out what Trump really benefited from was that a lot of people didn't like Hillary and didn't like elements of the left that were popularized on right-wing media, but Trump won not because people liked him, but because they didn't like what he was punching against. And people who punch the liberal elite in the face can win a lot of support. So if I was wrong about that. So if that's true, John, why was 2020 so close? Yeah. Um, now there, so that that's controversial. There are a lot of different analyses. Um, but I think, um, so wokeness was not such a big thing in 2016, um, but it really hit big time beginning 2018, 2019. Uh, and so um, again, a lot of what, and you know, and Trump's whole strategy in 2020 was the culture war. He had hardly any policies. It was all culture war stuff. Um, and so, uh, and so people were still, to the extent that people voted, many people voted uh, for him, not, and it would say, you know, I, I don't like him, but um, you know, I really don't like that. So, um, uh, now, of course, uh, the Democrats did uh, did better, you know, uh, elsewhere down the line. The Democrats did did uh, pretty well, um, but uh, yeah, I was expecting it to be a bigger victory for Biden as well. So, where do you see this all going? Give us give us your your map with the new crystal ball. Uh, well, anytime my pen nodes are activated, I think of Phil Tetlock, uh, your wonderful faculty member who is the world's expert on why we're so bad at predicting things. Um, so it's hard for me to make predictions, especially about the future, as Yogi Berra said. Um, but uh, I, I can just say um, trends won't continue forever. Um, I think uh, there will be some change in the social media environment. There will be, if not... The, the companies are going to tinker around the edges and offer us things like, for example, Twitter. Now, if you retweet an article that you haven't read, it says, you haven't read this article. Do you still want to retweet it? So there'll be little things like that from the tech companies. Um, I think other countries are going to do much more serious regulation in Australia and in the, and in the, uh, the, uh, the EU. They're not as beholden to the tech companies as our Congress is. So I think there will be some big changes in the nature of social media. I don't know if, if that will really help or change things. Um, I think overall, we're going to continue to be more polarized for a little while. I think things are going to get worse uh, before they get better. Um, but, and many people have predicted a lot of turbulence in the 2020s. So this is one of those periods where things are getting broken and they will reform. So I guess here's my prediction. Um, a year or two from now, two or three years from now, I'll say, uh, American democracy uh, will look 
a little worse and more unstable than it does now. Not necessarily than it did, you know, a few months because during the Trump administration, people were predicting the end. Um, but I think things look a little worse in uh, in a few years in ways that are hard to specify. To specify. Uh, but I'm going to predict that in 10 years, uh, things will be better, and uh, we'll see this era as an era in which a lot of things had to change, especially our economy. I think we'll have new and better forms of capitalism. That is, I think we'll find ways to be more inclusive, and I think the Biden administration is really working on that. Uh, I think we're learning that you know UBI and, and transferring cash to poor families helps them get out of the you know the clutches of all kinds of problems. So I think finally we're going to have some real progress on um, on American capitalism doing a better job for for the bottom third. I think that's something to look forward to. And while we're waiting for that day, a decade down the road, uh, you gave us great advice to be slower to judge and quicker to forgive. Any other guidance you can offer for having more thoughtful disagreements and making sure that we actually welcome diversity of thought in our families, in our communities, and on our campus? Um, yeah, before you before you go into any interaction, think what is your what is your intention here? And especially for a business audience, I highly recommend Caroline Webb's book, How to Have a Good Day. It's just brilliant at applying psychology, including work by by Adam. Um, it's just brilliant at applying psychology uh, to social settings, especially business settings. And she says, just take a moment before you start and think, what is my intention here? What is my aim? What are my assumptions? And if you go, uh, instead of going in thinking, well, you know, why am I right? What's my evidence? You think, what do I want to come out of this? Uh, and often it is, I want a closer relationship. I want this interaction to go well. Uh, and I don't have to be right about everything. Uh, just take that moment, change your mental set. And you'll see that even if other people are playing games, if you play the game that you really want to play, you'll have better outcomes. And often it brings the other person over as well. Well, this is a great example of that, right? I came here, actually, I didn't care at all about our friendship, John. I came here <laughs> I came here to learn and also hope that our audience could learn something from all the expertise and wisdom that you've been accumulating since you went to grad school here. And it is just such a delight to have you back. I could sit and listen to you all day. I have learned a lot. I know our audience has too. Thank you for taking the time. My pleasure, Adam. It's always a pleasure to talk, to talk with you, to read your work. Uh, and we have extensive quotes from you in the Coddling the American Mind, including some advice for how to have better conversations. Thank you. I'll try not to make you regret that. <laughs>